The story goes that there was once a girl in a primary school who was very good at drawing. The teacher one day told the class that they could draw whatever they wanted, and the girl decided that she would draw God. You can't draw God, said the teacher. We don't know what he looks like. Well, said the little girl, they will when I've finished. <laughs> Seeing God has always been a bit of an obsession of mankind. For Thomas, his cry for a show us the father in John's gospel, to the building of the golden calf here in Exodus that we were looking at a few weeks ago, trying to visually represent God. Moses, in our passage here, almost seems like he's jumping on the bandwagon, wanting to see what God looks like. We meet Moses this morning mid-conversation with God. We looked at the first half last week, we're looking at the second half this week. He's speaking with God in the tent of meeting that Moses had set up outside the camp. We saw him last time pleading with God to continue to go with them to the promised land as God had said that he would no longer go with them. And we saw last time that he appealed to God's character uh, and it was successful. He appealed to his reputation, his name, and God answered his prayer. God had agreed that he would go with them. But at this point, it's not clear exactly how God will remain with them because he's told them that if he goes with them, he'll destroy them. So in that context of God saying that he'll go with them but not really knowing how, God, uh, Moses asked to see God's glory. His kabod is the Hebrew word. His, his weightiness, his, his very self. Moses wants God to show himself to him. If he's going with them, he wants to see. Now you might think that's a bit of a random request. And actually God's already manifested his glory in several ways in Exodus. In Exodus 16.10, uh, as, as, uh, as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people, they looked towards the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Or Exodus 24.17, now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. God's already sort of shown his glory in some sort of ways. And it's also worth thinking, well, how does this have to do with God going with them? Well, God had promised his presence would go with them. And Moses now seemingly wants to hold God to his word. You say that you're coming with us. Well, show me that you're with us. But as we'll see, it doesn't quite turn out the way that Moses expects. And so our first point, nothing to do with the kids talk, <laughs> interestingly, but uh, seeing God's glory with our ears. Seeing God's glory with with our ears. Just have a look at verses 18 to 23 with me again. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses asks to see God's glory and is told in no uncertain terms that he cannot see God and live. For sinful man to see God's face would result in sudden death. Even the angels in heaven guard their faces from looking at God in his true essence. A reminder again that this is not just some Zeus or, or Odin, some old guy in the sky. No one can see God and live. But God will reveal his glory to Moses as he asked, just not in the way that he was expecting. Instead, God will put Moses in the cleft of a rock, a hiding place in the rock. Then God will cause all his goodness to pass before him. And God will speak to Moses and proclaim his name. And after that, he will look out and see his back. But even that is ambiguous. The word isn't actually back, it's backs, plural. It's more seemingly the sort of after effect of God having gone past rather than his literal back, the back of his being. What we see here, though, is that God will reveal himself, his glory, to Moses by speaking. 
It's through words that God will be known. And this is something that the Israelites with their golden calf had failed to grasp. They wanted to see God with their eyes. But God is saying, you can't see me with your eyes, but you can see me with your ears. You see, here Moses is given the ultimate experience of God in this mortal life. Not seeing with his eyes, but hearing God speak with his ears. So often we prioritize the eyes, don't we? Seeing is believing. A picture paints a thousand words. But what Moses sees about God, by him declaring his name verbally, seems at this point far more significant. I mean, anything that Moses could see would merely be an accommodation to his human eyes. I mean, think about it. God isn't made of atoms, is he? He made atoms. And we see anything by those things bouncing off them. So what would you even see? He would have to create a form to be seen in, wouldn't he? But that wouldn't be truly him. God's word, however, is how we truly experience God in this world. That is how God is known by his people. This is one of the reasons why God doesn't want images of himself. God is the God who speaks. As his word is spoken, as his word is proclaimed by others, God proclaims his name to Moses. He speaks because God knows what Moses needs to truly experience him. Not his eyes, but his ears. And the same is true today if you think about it. The ultimate experience of God in this life is having God speak to us by his word. That is how God primarily relates to us, through his word, the Bible, as it's preached, as it's read, in church, at home, wherever. God meets with us as we open up his word. That is where we come to him face to face, so to speak. Martin Luther, the German reformer, recounts a vision he once had, seeming to be the Lord Jesus, appealing to his eyes. This is what he said to the vision. Go away, confounded devil. I know no other Christ than he who, his word is, uh, than he who in his word is pictured to me. And after that, the image vanished. Typical Martin Luther there, isn't it? Just tells it to go away. But the word there, if you think about it, the word it is not there. That was an image. The word is where we go to meet with God. That's what Martin Luther was saying. Not that visions can't happen or don't happen, but that we don't need them. We see God. We experience God's glory through our ears as we open up God's word and hear him speak. So what do we find out about what God proclaims? Well, our second point this morning, God's glory is in his character. God's glory, glory is his character. Have a look at verses four to seven. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him and there proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God calls Moses back up the mountain. God will start again with his people and renew the covenant with new tablets of stone. While on the mountain, God reveals himself to Moses, proclaiming his name. But it's not just God saying, my name is the Lord. God is revealing to Moses what his name signifies, what it means. Now, we learned earlier in Exodus that God's name literally means I am. I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. That's what we're reading in the Bible when we see the word Lord in capital letters. Uh, in the Bible, I am. But there's a deeper significance to what Lord means. 
Someone's name was their character, was their reputation in the world. The same is true to a degree in our world. I mean, think about cars. If you said a name like Rolls-Royce, what sort of image does that picture to you? What sort of idea? What about Volkswagen? Again, slightly different picture. What about Skoda? Some people laughing there. I think they've improved. There used to be a joke when I was at school. What do you call a Skoda with a sunroof? A skip. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they've changed since then. But a name has a reputation, doesn't it? It carries an idea uh, in the world. Things are associated with that name. And those things that in our world that have become attac attached to it, we've sort of attached it to them. But the things that go with God na God's name are intrinsic to it. They're, they're naturally there. They're more than just a reputation that can be won or lost. They are who he is to his people. And that's an important thing to note. God does not give us a statement about his essence. You know, the Lord, the Lord, one undivided essence, undivided yet existing in three persons. Instead, he tells us who he is in the context of a fallen world, in relation to his people. This is his covenant name, how he relates to his people, the Lord. This is who he is to us. Some of his attributes, like his faithfulness and his steadfast love, are there all along. But forgiveness and mercy, well, if you think about it, those things can only exist in the context of people who need them. This is not a problem, though, for us as we look through this, since this is what we need to know about God in this fallen world as his people. This is who he is to us. So what does God reveal his name to mean to Moses? Well, it means that he is firstly merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious. The word merciful is quite a tricky one to define in the original language. It comes from the Hebrew word to touch or to feel. God is a feeling God, one who can be moved to pity. It's translated elsewhere as compassionate. But it's an active word. It's, it's to show genuine compassion. It comes from the word we, show, uh, we see in verse 19. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. The choice there is in God's hands, but he is a merciful God. He shows pity to his people. Gracious, confusingly, is also translated compassionate elsewhere in Exodus. But there it's in relation to him hearing the cries of the oppressed. The word comes from the Hebrew word to bend down. God condescends to his people. He doesn't ask us to rise up to his level, but it's a God who comes down to us on our level. He's gracious. He's also, secondly, slow to anger. Now, it's hidden in the English, but this is actually one of those times when God is, is given human characteristics. Okay? It literally says that God is long of nose, okay? God is long of nose or long of nostrils. Uh, they don't translate it directly because that would make no sense to us. But anger, if you think about it, is often expressed in the nostrils, okay? So when you get annoyed, your nostrils flare, don't they? You sort of get bigger. Well, it's saying that God has long nostrils, He's saying that it takes a long time for it to sort of work its way up. I mean, we talk about people, you know, sort of having smoke coming out of their nostrils. Well, it takes a long time for the smoke to come out. It takes a long time for God to explode. Like as the nostrils get bigger, you're sort of waiting for the explosion, aren't you? It takes God a long time to act in anger. Instead, he's marked by patience, not hot-headedness. And again, he's not Thor sort of sitting, waiting to throw a thunderbolt at those who've offended him. We're told, actually, that God is slow to anger. Same in the New Testament. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Even now, God patiently waits for, pe uh, for his people and people who have offended him to repent he does not utterly destroy the Israelites in the wilderness, despite their terrible rebellion. He waits and waits, but he will not wait forever. Next, we get two things that God abounds in. First, we're told he abounds in steadfast love. 
Now, steadfast love translates one word in Hebrew, hesed. Hesed is God's solid, loyal, faithful, steadfast love. It's his covenant loyalty and love to his people. It's not about a passing uh, feeling or a fleeting emotion. It's the steady, solid, setting his favor and affection on his people. It's his unshakable love, his unbreakable love. And God, we're told here, abounds in it, is mighty in it, is captain of it. All ways you could translate that. He overflows with that kind of love. He is that kind of love. It's intrinsic to who he is and has been for eternity. This is the love that God the Father has for God the Son. And that God the Son has for God the Father. A community of love with the Spirit. Unbreakable. What this passage says now is that that love that God shows towards himself is now shown towards his people. Towards you and I. Towards thousands even. Thousands of generations possibly could be how that's translated. Isn't that incredible? That amazing love that just overflows to his people. He's abounding in it. He's also abounding in faithfulness. The word for faithfulness in Hebrew comes from the word built up or, or established. It's the idea of certainty, truth, stability. Someone you can put your faith in. Someone who's got a track record. Someone you can trust. Now that can sound quite passive, can't you? You know, he's sort of he's there when you need him. But God abounds in faithfulness. He is actively faithful to his people. He is working for their good. He's doing what is right consistently. So he's not just a God that we can trust. He's not just a God, um, he's a God that we have to trust. He's so abounding in faithfulness. Do you see what I mean? He's not there as a crutch when we need him. He's the one giving strength to our legs moment by moment, even when we think that we're sort of walking and acting on our, ourselves. He's that faithful that he upholds us second by second. Combine that abundant love and that abundant faithfulness, and we see God fiercely guarding his steadfast love to thousands, faithfully loving his people. Fourthly, he's forgiving. Now, the word here for forgive is not the normal one in the Bible. It's not the same as in verse 9, for example. It literally means to carry to bear or to lift. Now, I don't want to push this too far, as it is used uh, sometimes for forgive. But when it is, it's the idea of a burden being lifted off us. God takes off our, our iniquity, our transgression and our sin. Now, we know, of course, with New Testament eyes that he lifts it off us and he places it on Christ on the cross. He bears it himself on the cross of Calvary. This will help us make sense of what follows, but more of that in a minute. But we see that God is a God of forgiveness. And not just of mistakes, of full-blown sins. He lists them out, doesn't he? Sins, iniquities, transgressions. So often nowadays we talk of sins as mistakes, as though they were sort of an accident, not really our fault. But we know that often that's not the case. Sometimes we hurt people with our words and our actions. And whilst they might not have been thought through, they were only revealing what's inside us. We are sinners and we sin. That's a matter of fact, isn't it? But here God doesn't just forgive our mistakes. He forgives our sins. In fact, you could translate verse 7, he forgives evil, rebellion and offences. And that should give us hope, shouldn't it? Because... We don't just make mistakes as human beings, even as Christians. We sin, we transgress, we break God's commandments. We hurt one another, we hurt God. But if God only forgave mistakes, we'd be toast, wouldn't we? But he forgives all manner of sins. As the song we've been learning in recent weeks goes, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. That's not a license to sin. But it is a lifeboat to those who are drowning in their sin, overcome by despair. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. God is a God of forgiveness. 
But that doesn't mean God is a pushover. He's also finally just. Again, the Hebrew word is a bit tricky here. It literally says, with clearing, he will not clear. All clear? Yeah? (laughs) The word guilty isn't there, but it is implied. It's the idea that God does just not clear the guilty. It's the idea he doesn't just sweep their guilt under the carpet. He is just. He cares about justice. And so even his forgiveness must be just. Sin must be punished. It talks about him visiting the iniquities of, uh, on their children to the third and fourth generation. It's saying here that God punishes them. Uh, it's not saying, sorry, that, that God punishes them for the sins of their father eternally. But they will be allowed to face the consequences of their parents' sin. God allows sin to have consequences. Think about it as Solomon and his son Rehoboam. Solomon seems to get away with his idolatry and turning away from the Lord. And yet his son must live with the consequences of what Solomon did. His kingdom is split. We all live with the consequences of Adam's sin. We're far more interconnected than we think we are in our Western individualistic society. And yet we're all responsible for our own sin before God. We see that clearly elsewhere in scripture. Ezekiel 18. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. We must all live with the earthly consequences of what our parents did. But the eternal consequences of their actions are theirs alone. We cannot gain eternal life or lose eternal life because of who our parents are. God is just and he deals with sin justly. How? By placing the punishment on Christ. It's not swept under the carpet in some favoritist miscarriage of justice. The sin of believers is not just lifted, it is placed on Christ. God deals with it justly. And it's on the basis of that, on the basis of what is revealed, that Moses prays to God for the people in light of what we've just heard. And so our last point, appealing to God's character. Let me read to you verses 8 and 9. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, if now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. The section finishes with another prayer from Moses. And really it gives us a, a clue to the real motivation behind what's happening. It's not just that Moses wanted a sort of extra special experience with God, or even just that Moses wanted God to prove that he was still with them. Behind it all comes his grounds as mediator for the people. Moses, all the way through this section, has been praying for the people based on what God has revealed. So if you look back, you've got things where he sort of says words to the effect of, you said you're pleased with me, God. Well, Lord, if you're pleased with me, do this. You've said that we're your people. Well, Lord, are you going to abandon your people? You've said that you're acting for your name. Well, Lord, are you going to act for your name by not destroying your people? All the way through, he's appealing to what God has revealed, what God has said. And now, after having heard what God has said about himself, do you notice that his prayer adapts as well? He changes. Moses bows his head. And praise that the God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, he prays to that God to forgive their iniquity, transgression and sin and go with them. Do you see how this builds on what went before? He'd said last time that he would go with them, but also that if he went with them, he would destroy them because of their sin. Well, now Moses asks for pardon for that sin, forgiveness. That is the only way that they will survive with God's forgiveness. And we saw last time that God will answer that in part through the sacrificial system, a system that allowed for the pardoning of their transgression through sacrifices. 
a system that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ and his ultimate sacrifice for sin. We, we know that's where that's going. But for a few moments, I want us to think about Moses' prayer and what that means for how we pray. Our prayers, like Moses' prayer, should always be the second half of a conversation. Do you know what I mean? God speaks to us and we speak back to him based on what he said. God reveals himself in the word and we reply in prayer based on what we've learned from him in the Bible. So often our problems arise because we want to speak first. We want to tell God what to do. We want God to follow our agenda. After all, we've got everything basically sorted, haven't we? We know what God should do. We secretly think, well, if I were God, then I'd do this or that. So why doesn't God do that for me? But we're not God. And God's not just a more powerful version of you or I with the same opinions and the same agenda. God is his own person with his own character and his own actions. We know what he's like, not by looking inside ourselves to what we think and what we want, but outside to the word, to what he's revealed about himself. That's not to limit our prayers, but to reframe them as it does with Moses here. The more he knows of God, the more effectively he can pray. He prays in line with what God has revealed first. In fact, if you think about it, it's totally fitting to pray to a God who has just revealed himself as gracious and compassionate and forgiving to appeal to him to forgive. If you think about it, God, by telling us about himself and his identity of the Lord as the Lord, is actually really setting the agenda for our prayers. Again, imagine that he'd said this. I am the Lord, the Lord, generous and bountiful, abounding in cash. What would the agenda be? It would be money. It would be stuff. It would be material. God would be the ATM in the sky. But then what does he reveal about himself? And what he does reveal about himself tells us what he wants to give us. If he tells us that he's a forgiving God, it's because he wants us to ask him for forgiveness. He tells us he's merciful and gracious so that we ask him for mercy and grace. He tells us that he's abounding in love and faithfulness because that's what we need from him. Even telling us that he is just at the end is an incentive to come for him to him for forgiveness. Because we'll see the peril if we have to stand before him unforgiven. What the Israelites needed from God in this fallen world, what we still need from God today in this world, is forgiveness due to his mercy and compassion. That is how he wants us to relate to him. Not as perfect people who think they have no need of mercy or forgiveness, but as we really are, as sinners in need of grace. Coming not because we are entitled to forgiveness, but because he freely offers it to us through trusting in Christ. How often, though, do we let God set the agenda in our prayers? How often do we let him speak first before just plowing in with our requests? How often do we appeal to what he's told us about what he's like as a basis for what we're praying? Can we even pray some of the prayers that we pray when we look at his character? I mean, we've got so much more information than even Moses did about God. We know him even better. Now, I'm not saying that we always need to read scripture before we pray. I'm not saying we can only pray for something if it directly relates to an attribute of God that's mentioned in the Bible. But how often do we stop and think about what God would want in this situation? How often do we search the scriptures for his perspective on something and then pray in line with that? The more we soak ourselves in the word, what God has said, then the more we'll be able to pray in line with what God wants. The more we'll understand and consider his agenda in all this, what he wants. You see, even here in this passage, God wants the Israelites to make it to the promised land. And so he gets Moses to pray about it. He reveals himself to Moses and then has Moses pray for what the people really need. So what do you or I really need? Do we need to know what God looks like, like that little girl and her teacher? Or do we need to come to him 
based on what he's revealed to us as beloved but sinful creatures in need of forgiveness. Well, let's come to him based on who he is and trust in Christ's sacrifice for our forgiveness. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you don't leave us in the dark as to what you're like. Father, thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. And Father, we know by what you have revealed that you are a forgiving and merciful God. So often, though, Father, we, we don't want to come to you uh, when we've sinned. Father, we don't want to come to you when we've messed up. But Father, help us to, to know that what you've revealed is true and come to you for forgiveness and mercy in our time of need. Father, thank you for your faithfulness and abounding love towards us. Help us to keep that in our minds this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.